Indonesia has failed to uh, fight against the racist racism in Indonesia. National operation of Papuans themselves will form a Papuan national identity to determine their own destiny. Uh, that will strengthen the spirit of resistance in West Papua against the Indonesian authorities. Uh, not only by the people of Papua, but uh, it will join by the people of Indonesia. I think the Indonesian people start to open their eyes uh, to the people of West Papua, to the operation of the people of West Papua, so that Indonesia cannot uh, hide uh, the, uh, the operation under the jargon of Indonesian unity, under the jargon of the Indonesian unity.
Is it on? Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our, our webinar today. Um, this webinar, again, uh, is to call for the uh, immediate and unconditional release of West Papan political prisoners, in particular, the seven in Balikpapan right now. And um, the, uh, thank you for Tapol and Ethan to host uh, our, uh, this very important webinar today. Tapol is a London-based um, human rights organization campaigning for human rights, peace, and democracy in Indonesia. And also to Ethan, the East Timor and Indonesia Action Network, a US-based grassroots organization working in solidarity with the peoples of Timor-Leste, West Papua, and Indonesia. Um, and I'm sure that uh, many of you would like to hear comments from Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, I would like to apologize in advance that uh, we asked uh, Professor Chomsky in such short notice that uh, his comments will be will only be arriving in the next few days and we will be publishing it as soon as we get it. So our webinar today will be, uh, we will make it in uh, 75 minutes. And uh, the, the, the rundown is that we will start with uh, two speakers first, uh, West Papuan, uh, former West Papuan political prisoner, and then uh, the uh, West Papua based human rights lawyer after that, we will uh, hear some solid. Uh, we will look at this, some solidarity messages, and after that, we will go to our uh, two international speakers. So, uh, for the uh, the first speaker, uh, we are honored to, and I would like also to thank our speakers today because uh, uh, you are all willing to do this uh, despite the short notice. So, our first speaker today, uh, Philip Karma. He's a uh, West Papuan peaceful political activist, ex-political prisoner, and an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience. Philip Karma was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment for treason in 2005, but released early in uh, 2015. So please, uh, Baba Philip, silakan. Maybe unmute. Hello. No. Okay. Can you hear yep. Me? Yes, we can Hello? hear now. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, participating in this uh, session. Yeah. I have uh, experience uh, 11 years in the jail. I must run for 15 years, but because of you all in the world, in the international, in Indonesia, also in Papua, combined about my case, and that is make big pressure for government, and they release me after 11 years. That's why I say thank you very much for all of you. In my opinion, from the beginning, Indonesia take over the West Papua. The West Papua people, they didn't like to join with Indonesia because they know fairly they have a right to independence and that's government ready prepare them to the independence in their own self. But uh, Indonesia uh, not uh, give a uh, yeah not uh, looking for uh, West Papua people what they want 
but Indonesia want to occupy this land because this land have uh, many things about uh, wood, about uh, uh, mine and everything in this land. And Indonesia didn't care about uh, my people. And in the in, in other side, uh, Indonesian soldiers come in Papua. In the beginning, they still uh, uh, intimidate, intimidate for Papuan people. Um, they use uh, military and police also intelligent agent to every time watching for what Papua people doing every day. If in the first time Indonesia come, if uh, some people of Papua, they standing in the road and they still talking and military or police come and cut them and put in the jail, also kick them. But that is uh, they cut them not uh, follow the rule. And then Indonesian government give a uh, uh, penalty for them for uh, for yeah I mean uh, long long term for them that is to uh, intimidate uh, West Papuan people feeling or uh, West Papua people, if they want to talk about the independent, that's why government give big penalty for them. Until the, my time in 2004, they catch me and give penalty is uh, 15 years. After then, because the campaign of you all in the world and Indonesia, uh, uh, because the pressure of many countries in the international, also many of uh, NGO, that's why. Uh, after then, some of Papua people, if they make uh, some activity to campaign about independence, they cut them and on, uh, give uh, only uh, low penalty. But I think maybe now, because of the uh, so many of people in Indonesia now, they know really what happened in Papua and many of Indonesian people, they, after they know and they change their behavior to support uh, West Papua people. That's why I make uh, Indonesian government now maybe panic. That's why they want to give big penalty for their seven uh, friend in Balikpapan now. That is my opinion. I think that's why, uh, yeah, now they give big penalty for them. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, thank you so much, uh, Baba Philip, for your uh, testimony. And um, yeah, uh, Baba, do you, uh, if I may ask, um, uh, what do you think about like after all of this period? Then you were released in 2015, but then we see that these seven uh, prosecutors are demanding such long sentences against these seven political prisoners. What do you think about that? Mute, unmute. Yes. Unmute, Bapak Philip itu, Mike. Oh, um, I see that a uh, Baba Philips network bandwidth is too low, it says. So, okay. Um, maybe we should go to the uh, Baba. Yeah, so sorry about that, Baba Philip, but um, I think it's with the uh, bad internet connection. Um, okay, um, our second speaker before we go to our second speaker i would like to tell the uh, the audience that you can ask questions to our speakers today please leave your uh, comments in the um, uh, in the comment section and uh, after the uh, because after the, uh, the the speakers finish uh, then we will have a q and a session so to our uh, for our uh, second speaker anum siregar She's a human rights lawyer based in Jayapura, West Papua. Her organization is one of the few NGOs that provides pro bono advocacy for West Papuan political prisoners and rights activists. She's also the uh, one of the uh, team of lawyers currently representing the Balikpapan 7. So please, Kakanu. Okay, thank you, Fero. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give some my experience about the process, legal process for the political prisoners. I will explain about the practice of discrimination of the Indonesian justice system against Papuan people. So as we know, the practice of discrimination in Papua against Papuan people has been around for the long time since the external existence comes to Papua, such as like religions, government or companies, they are already wrong assumption about Papua. This assumption such as Papua must be repaired repair, change, save, or build. Not from the perspective of the Papuan themselves. Therefore, there is already a differentiate, differentiating view precisely to demean Papuan people. This is the stigma. How the stigma start in Papua about this situation. And now the stigma changes from behavior to the system. I mean, in the Indonesia system. So even though there are policy or the, like the special autonomy law, which is said the provide protection uh, or respect for the existence of Papuan people, it is inconsistent and always being controlled by Jakarta. So, for example, Papua may have a political party, but it must be approved by Jakarta. Papua may have regional songs or flag, but it must be approved by Jakarta. Then this is proving that the discrimination is still strong. 
So now how about discrimination in the legal process? So we have many example about the situation. The criminalization of the movement of your who use spaces for the freedom of expression. A large number of arrests being held in custody for one day. With the police said there were secured, even though there was no time to be secured. Obviously, it was an arrest. They, they are identified one by one. Then the leaders are put on the trial. So even they being realized, they are not really free right now. And public and politicization of human rights issues so that Papuan people are easily accused of treason. Talking about the basic right of indigenous people, land grabbing, talk about the human rights violation or law enforcement, rejecting racism easily being called as, as treason. While in Jakarta, people talk about the, the overthrowing power, forming a new parliament, a new state, they are not being processed. This is, you know, discrimination uh, among Papuan situation in Jakarta. And we can uh, look one example, uh, implementation of the multi multi article to try Papuans who who are considered against the state. Like the main article we know about the treason about the emergency law on ammunition or weapon without permission. So it does not give the room for Papuan people to get out of the law, especially democracy activists and young people. And some the problem about the evidence is forced by the changing the police investigation report. The police investigation always changes the investigation paper. One day they make the one investigation paper, and the next step they change the investigation paper. Even before some someone in the in arrest, the person is assumed that is being the perpetrator. For example, Buktar Tabuni and friend has not been arrested, but the couple said, make the statement, I know the actors. It is like the, you know, get the article before the law process, before the under justice process. And one of them, we know, they have experience about the torture. For example, in Wamena around January 2016, we heard about the uh, Edison Hesegem was arrested on the police station and now they bring to the hospital and he died. And then we, we heard uh, the, for the Buktar uh, Tabuni and, and friends, the political prisoner in the Balik Papan, you know, when they, when they were arrested, their eyes were closed when they were beaten at the first investigation without the lawyer or the other people, only them and the police in the police office. So we know the violence, the torture become to the political prisoner, not only long, long time, not only the you know the the case uh, ten years ago, but now for them for the Buktar for the Henki Lapok, and he make you know he make uh, explanation in the court, but you know the judges or the prosecutor deny what happened with them. So we know discrimination will make problem more complicated in Papua. Internal one internalization of the Papuan pro, Papua problem and internalization internalization of the movement in Papua are getting stronger. The legal process will capitalize the youth leaders so that at the end of the legal process they will be much stronger than before. 
the Indonesia government must realize the situation. They must be stronger than before, than before, both individually or in groups. So no one return to the arm of the United of the Indonesia, or you know, they become to the Indo the good citizen of Indonesia. So instead, more of them are being more more away from the Republic of Indonesia. And for me, the Indonesia government must correct this bad behavior and system. So the in existence of the Indonesia, indigenous Papua must be respected. Gathering and gathering and expression space must be opened. The legal process must be carried out in the professional manner. Everyone must be equal before the law. I think enough. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kakanum. So some uh, several uh, takeaways that I think that very important need to be highlighted is from Kakanum is that um, so the, the the discriminatory treatment against West Papuans is first like uh, West Papuans cannot just cannot say anything about their human rights. Uh, the the state will simply just say anything you uh, anything what West Papuans are saying are treasonous. They are subjected to uh, these uh, uh, treason articles. And then second one is that there is no presumption of innocence towards West Papuans, like uh, Kaka Anum uh, uh, gave an example how the uh, the police chief at that time already said that Bukhtar Tabuni is the actor behind the uh, uprising without uh, a due process of law. And, and then another uh, that West Papuans often be, often be subjected to violence and torture uh, and no lawyer provided during in investigation. And uh, finally, uh, that this um, uh, the treatment by the Indonesian state will only make the movement stronger and then deepen the wound, uh, which then makes the uh, bigger gap uh, from uh, Jakarta to uh, West Papua. Thank you, Kakanum. That's very uh, insightful. So please, again, please leave your uh, question at the uh, comment section in the YouTube or Facebook uh, uh, that you're watching. And before we go to our international speakers, let's see some uh, solidarity mes messages for this uh, uh, for the Balik Papan Seven. So West Papuans across uh, West Papua and also outside West Papua have been uh, um, have been announcing their uh, solidarity towards the Balik Papan Seven. These are the uh, from uh, this morning alone. We have a uh, religious leaders in West Papua express their uh, call for the immediate release of the Balik Papan Seven. And also the communion churches of Indonesia in Indonesia also have called for the uh, 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 same uh, demand. And uh, and right now uh, today actually uh, that the uh, we have solidarity from many um, student associations uh, across Indonesia. This is actually a uh, a, a new um, what is it called? Like uh, uh, the movement is actually getting bigger just like uh, Kaka Anum highlighted before. And uh, we would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, new solidarity from uh, Indonesian people, not just West Papua. And next, uh, we are going for the uh, third uh, speaker. Um, sorry. Uh, third speak our third speaker today is Eben uh, Kirksey. He's an academic at both the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, 
and the Alfred Deakin Institute of Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. He's an activist and longtime advocate for West Papua. Uh, please, Evan, thank you. It's a real honor to be here amongst uh, real uh, human rights leaders and, and, and visionaries uh, from, from West Papua. I, I think in situations like this, in situations where there's intense repression, where there's genocide, where there's ongoing discriminatory treatment targeting uh, indigenous people, targeting black people, it's, it's easy to focus on the violence. It's easy to focus on the intensity of the oppression. But what I'd like to do today is really celebrate the transformative visions, the ethical uh, uh, principles, the freedom dreams, the uh, very expansive imagination of intellectuals uh, from West Papua, like Philip Karma, as, as well as black uh, intellectuals here in the United States. So this, this week in the United States, we've seen an unprecedented outpouring of support for Black Lives Matter. You know, this, this is a campaign that has its roots in the civil rights movement. Um, we have civil rights leaders, African-Americans who are in positions of power now. And when, when I first met Philip Karma um, more than 20 years ago, in 1998, um, I, I actually didn't meet him, but I heard of him. I, I happened to be in Biak the day that there was a flag raising. Um, and at that moment, Philip Karma was calling on the Papuan people to use tactics of civil disobedience, to use peaceful tactics of, of protest, um, to, to call for a reckoning. Um, you know, Philip earlier talked about uh, the unhappiness from, from the initial moment of the Indonesian military invasion, the unhappiness of the Papuan people uh, under this condition of military rule. And in 1998, he had the courage to demand in a public place an accounting for that violence and imagine, he had the boldness to imagine a new future. Um, this week, I've been thinking a lot about a book called Freedom Dreams by Robin Kelly. And this is about the history of the Black imagination in, in the United States, a, a vision of transforming relations of power, uh, political relationships, so, so that the oppression in the United States does not continue. And Robin Kelly in that book talks about, um, if you just look at, um, political movements of African-American intellectuals in the US on the basis of a narrow idea of success. They haven't been successful in the sense that the basic power relations that they've sought to overturn haven't changed. You know, we still see uh, black young men and women being killed by police in the United States of America. This is what the protests this week are all about. But Robin Kelly insists that we hold on to the transformative visions, uh, the political, po political dreams of, of intellectuals who are participating in these struggles and inspiring future generations uh, to struggle for change. So, so I see Philip Karma's legacy um, you know, in, in that broader history of, of black intellectuals who are aspiring for something that seems impossible, for, for liberation from these extremely repressive uh, military and police tactics from legal systems that don't treat them as being fully human before the law, something that Anam Surigar was, was just talking about. So, so these young men that have just been uh, sentenced to extraordinary sentences and you know, for, for peaceful demonstrations that brought people to the streets last year, rallying behind the cry of Black Lives Matter, rallying behind the the cry of Papuan lives matter, indigenous lives matter. These young men have that same revolutionary vision, a vision of a indigenous future that doesn't involve a perpetuation of, of the contemporary relations of power. So, so it's, it's that ethical vision, those beautiful freedom dreams that I wanna hold on to and celebrate. So, so here in the US, when uh, Philip Karma was, was first in prison, um, it wasn't really noticed. You know, the first the first time following the flag raising in 1998, power was 
functioning predictably here in the US. You know, there's there's heavy investment. Um, the largest gold mine in the world, Freeport McMoran, is heavily invested in the status quo of the Indonesian military rule in, in West Papua. We also have British Petroleum there. So, so the power brokers in Washington, D.C. don't want to hear about civil rights activists, don't want to hear about black intellectuals that aspire to reconfigure the, the relations of power. Um, after he was arrested a second time for, for waving a flag and raising a flag along with, with Yusak Pakage, um, people started to notice and um, started to recognize that you know, these same principles that animated the civil rights movement here in the US, principles of nonviolent civil disobedience, that these, these are universal values that we wanna celebrate, that we wanna support worldwide. So, so after Philip was recognized as an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience, after organizations like Human Rights Watch, um, Freedom Now, the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Center for Human Rights, took up this case as, as one to champion. Um, power relations started to shift and you, you saw um, senior members of Congress of the Congressional Black Caucus, like John Conyers, um, someone who was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, someone um, you know, who had profound influence as the longest serving member of Congress. He became the Dean of Congress, along with other members of the Congressional Black Caucus, like Donald Payne, like any Fali of Amma Vega, we saw, we saw these African-American leaders become champions of, of this vision of freedom in West Papua. And, and I think right now, the, the time is ripe for a similar campaign. Um, we're, we're at the beginning, you know, in, in Washington, the, the forces that um, sort of uh, structure US policy towards Indonesia are very much invested in the status quo. In London, um, a, a very similar story in Geneva, in Canberra, um, but also in, in places like, like Beijing, um, Jakarta. You know, these elected officials and centers of power have, have an opportunity right now to, to listen, to listen to, to stories that uh, seem marginal, but are, are utterly important. So, you know, in, in this week, as people gather in the streets here in the US, and in a moment that very much echoes what happened last year in West Papua, when people are simply asking for police brutality to end, for the arbitrary detention of activists to end, for the punitive sentencing, you know, 17 years in jail for participating in a peaceful protest is, is ridiculous when, when viewed within the frame of international human rights law, when viewed, um, you know, in, in this legacy of, of nonviolent civil disobedience embodied by Dr. Martin Luther King, embodied by Mahatma Gandhi. So, so these, these student leaders who are imprisoned um, just this week, um, you know, I, I think there's a real opportunity for the international human rights community to come uh, together around their case. Um, there's, there's an opportunity for intersectional political organizing on national uh, levels in Indonesia, on international levels, as, as indigenous lives matter um, with renewed um, importance here in the US, as black lives matter becomes a mainstream issue you know, there, there is a real uh, new opportunity for international solidarity. And, and I think, you know, people who are in positions of power, the Congressional Black Caucus remains a very powerful force in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, even amidst the current administration that uh, uh, the White House has hate speech emitting from it. There's, there's white nationalist movements that are gaining ground here right now. But even in this precarious moment in U.S. history, I really think there is a profound opportunity uh, to do that work similar to what we did with, with the case of, of Philip Karma, to unite behind these young men who have been given unjust sentences. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Eben. That's a, a very uh, insightful. And yeah, uh, like what Eben said actually today, um, uh, why also we invite uh, Bapa Philip Karma? It's because it, it reminds us, like we thought that we have moved on when uh, Bapa Philip was sentenced to 15 years and then he was released early 
I remember that uh, Bapak Philip maybe can say about this more, but I remember when uh, Bapak Philip was released, uh, Bapak Philip said that uh, and the Indonesian state forced me into jail and the Indonesian state also forced me out of jail. Like, <laughs> like uh, yeah, I remember that bit. Yeah, so we are, it's as if like, like we, are, we are starting again, back, go, uh, Indonesia is going backwards because uh, now uh, the uh, Indonesian prosecutors are seeking 17 years and 15 years uh, against uh, two people, all for their political activities. Um, and now uh, we go to our uh, uh, last uh, speaker, last but not least, um, Peter Tacho. Uh, he is uh, London-based, uh, uh, UK-based, uh, and has been ca campaigning for human rights, democracy, LGBT freedom, and global justice since 1967. He and his foundation, the Peter Tatchell Foundation, uh, the, uh, are long time are long time supporters of West Papua. We are very uh, honored to have you. Uh, please, Peter. Well, thank you very very much. It's a great honor to join you with such a distinguished panel, and I'm very very glad to have so many people joining this webinar to hear the struggle, the battle for. West Papuan rights and freedom. Of course, this webinar takes place in the context of the global Black Lives Matter protests. And of course, in West Papua, that is ever, ever so relevant, given that Indonesia practices systemic racism against the indigenous peoples of West Papua. Now, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, it has to be Black Lives Matter in every corner of the world, including West Papua. And we need to build a movement of solidarity right across the globe to support those heroic, courageous, brave and inspirational West Papuans who are taking a stand against Indonesian annexation and occupation. They are awesome. I salute them. I am so honored to be able to do something small to support your just struggle. And believe you me, it has been a long struggle, but you will win. No tyranny lasts forever. Indonesia will have its fall. Adolf Hitler promised the Third Reich lasting 1,000 years. It lasted all of 12 years. Indonesia's been occupying West Papua longer than 12 years, but believe you me, its day will come, a reckoning will come, and West Papua will be free. When we look at what is happening in West Papua today, uh, Indonesia is violating its own human rights commitments. It has signed up to the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It signed up to the ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights which guarantee freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, freedom of association, the right to protest, the right to free speech, protection against torture, detention without trial, and extrajudicial killings. So Indonesia is standing in violation of the very human rights agreements that it itself has signed and pledged to uphold. We need to have Indonesia held to account. We need to ensure that Indonesia abides by those declarations in terms of not only the people of West Papua, but all the people of Indonesia. One of the big problems we have is of course, the shame and disgrace of Western complicity in Indonesia's tyranny in West Papua. Um, Indonesia is supplied arms by Western countries like the United States, Britain, the Netherlands, France, and Germany. The question is, why are we selling arms to a tyrannical regime which is abusing West Papuan people? We've got to call for an end to Western arms sales, to cut off those instruments of repression that are being used against the people of West Papua. 
We also need to begin a campaign or extend a campaign because it's already begun, but extend and expand the campaign against Western companies who are exploiting West Papua's natural resources against the wishes and without the consent of the West Papuan people. I'm talking about BP, Rio Tinto, Conoco Phillips, um, Freeport Macoran, Queensland Nickel, and Nippon Oil, just to name a few. These Western companies are taking advantage of Indonesia's military subjugation to rip off the natural resources of the people of West Papua. We need to begin a boycott and sanctions campaign against those companies. And you know, we can have an effect. We all, I think, are familiar with the success of the global anti-apartheid movement with its campaign of sanctions, disinvestment and boycotts against apartheid South Africa. Of course, the struggle there was won primarily by black South Africans and their allies, but the international campaign really helped turn the screws on the South African regime. And I believe we can do the same with Indonesia. I think also, we need to press for the United Nations to send a fact-finding mission to West Papua, to get a UN rapporteur to go to West Papua to investigate and report to the General Assembly and to the Human Rights Council on the violations of human rights in West Papua. We also need to press Indonesia to lift entry restrictions on human rights defenders and journalists who are currently barred from entry into West Papua. And finally, we need to ensure that Western aid to Indonesia is conditional on respect for human rights. We cannot give a blank check to Indonesia. We have to insist that if they want aid, that it has to be conditional on the respect of the human rights of the people of West Papua. I'm not suggesting that all aid should be cut, but certainly it should be perhaps switched from the Indonesian government to NGOs that do not uh, discriminate, who are not implicated in the oppression of the West Papuan people. Now, I haven't got all the answers, but those are a few ideas that I think are worth considering. They've been applied in many other situations. I mentioned apartheid South Africa, but many other countries as well with success. My final point is just to reiterate my heartfelt solidarity with the people of West Papua in your long, arduous, painful, but heroic struggle for freedom. As I said, you will win because no tyranny lasts forever. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's very powerful. And uh, the call for um, international solidarity. And I personally think that it is very important because I, uh, if Black Lives Matter can sweep across the globe, it means like uh, human rights is, is a universal value and international uh, solidarity is possible. That um, also, Amnesty International has described West Papua as a uh, black, uh, human rights black hole. So it really needs uh, international support. Thank you, Peter. Now we go to uh, question and answers. There's uh, many, there, there are many. And uh, we would like to hear from Bapa Philip Karma first. Uh, first questions for him because uh, hopefully that uh, he's got a better <laughs> connection now. Bapa Philip, uh, if you could uh, unmute. Oh, sorry, I haven't asked the questions. Uh, okay, the, the first question, uh, Bapa Philip, um, is it possible for Papuan human rights to be respected as long as Indonesia controls the country and people continue to struggle for independence? Unmute dulu, Bapak Philip. Nah, ya. Yeah. Now is um, for Papuan people very difficult to uh, make a peaceful demonstration. If we arrange a peaceful demonstration, 
police didn't allow us to uh, make uh, action like that. For example, for six six times, I make a letter to police for uh, inform that inform them about uh, make a kamisan kamisan action in Jayapura with Miss Mrs Anum also, but police didn't allow us to make a demonstration, peaceful demonstration like that. If someone want to make a peaceful activity like demonstration, uh, police ready stay in the uh, in the some uh, point point in the road for uh, for barrier them, not for action like that, and say them to not make an action like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Bapa Philip was saying that uh, yeah, there's just, there's simply no way, no space for West Papuan to be able to speak. Uh, he was uh, giving an example of Kamisan. Kamisan is a, uh, a, a, a nationwide, but mainly in Jakarta, a, a peaceful protest um, on every Thursday. Kamis is Thursday. And it's now uh, almost, uh, uh, I think it is the uh, almost 500, more than 500 times already uh, every uh, Thursday. But so, so Kamisan can take place in uh, uh, other than West Papua peacefully, but in Jayapura, uh, in West Papua, it is prohibited. So that's how discriminatory the treatment is. And uh, Bapa Philip also uh, uh, raised about uh, Facebook posting. I would like to remind you that a, uh, from the, uh, there are 46 political prisoners uh, charged with treason right now in West Papua. One of them, Asa Aso, currently detained in uh, Jayapura, he's being uh, uh, detained for treason over Facebook posting. So Facebook posts as treason. That's how West Papua cannot speak. Um, and uh, Bapa Philip, uh, if you don't mind, again, a question for you. Um, Bapa, um, I would like to uh, hear Bapa Philip talk about your experience studying in the Philippines, how it affected your understanding of Indonesian racism. Yeah, the time I'm studying Philippines, that is the first time I feel, oh, uh, another people they see, they see me like them, not any racism. But in Indonesia, the time I study in Java, oh, very racism. But I think only in uh, I mean, in the time during the I study in Java, maybe now is more democracy in Indonesia. Maybe uh, some people in Java didn't do like that. But after then, I asked for some student in Java after I released from jail. But they say, oh, uh, Bapa, this is, they say, oh, father, not changed. We also, every day, we uh, have an experience about racism like that. Because some people in Java, they uh, do uh, something is bad for us, like uh, from, they ask, they, they say something like that. They say monkey or like that. That is, I think, oh, from uh, 1970 until now, uh, people of 
Indonesia, not almost, but maybe in some area, they didn't change their mind. They didn't. Uh, they didn't think of people. Uh, black people is same with us, but they uh, black people is different. They is uh, there is nothing like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have one personal question, Papa, before we go to the questions to other speakers. Um, so when you were released, Bapak, in uh, 2015, and uh, President Jokowi at that time also released uh, five other uh, political prisoners. And then uh, for two years, three years, we don't have a new, uh, newly uh, detained uh, political prisoner charged with reason. But right now, we have, in the wake of the uprising, we had uh, 56 right now 46 because 10 have since been released what do you think about that bapa as a west pop one as a west pop one do you think that oh for some time i thought uh president jokowi has good faith about us or it never occurred to you or or what do you think about that yeah that is make me to have a question mark in my mind my mind because uh the time Mr. President released uh, five of my friends in uh, Jayapura prisoner, a uh, Jayapura prison. He give a uh, appointment for them. This is feast, but after then I can release all the Papuan uh, political prisoner. He say like that to. Uh, Five of my friend, maybe Mrs. Anum uh, attending the meeting, then she can uh, help also what uh, what president say to them like that. <laughs> okay. But now, uh, yeah, like you say before. We didn't see uh, Mr. President release some political prisoner, but now increase. <laughs> also, I remember in Molucas also, we have uh, four people from before in uh, President, Mr. President Bambang Yudhoyono era. Still, four people uh, stay in the prison in Ambon, in Molucas. We already tell to Mr. Minister of Law, Mr. Uh, yeah, I forget the name. <laughs> Yasona, Mr. Yasona. He say he can try to. Uh, transfer them from Nusa Kambangan to Ambon. After then, try to release them. But until now, uh, no. Four people still stay in the prison, in the jail. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bapa Philip. Uh, yeah, so right now we have 10 Molukan political prisoners detained on prison charges right now. So F is declining, yeah? Uh, okay. Now uh, a question to Kakano: What policies, reforms, or steps can the Ind Indonesian government take to end racist violence and impunity in West Papua? This is actually a question for Bapa Philip too, but we go for Kakano first to answer. Kakano, please unmute. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So for me. Uh, we hope the Indonesia government to change the policy, the policy about the uh, the situation in Papua, because yeah, we know when the Jokowi said the for the Papua we use the for uh, welfare approach, but in fact in Papua it is about the security approach. So we need to consistent 
from the Jokowi how to make the bad how to change the bad situation in Papua to the you know to the to respect the human rights situation in Papua and we hope the we we, we think uh, when it's not solution to bring you know to bring the the young people to the prison and make the treason because you know because the demonstration and we hope the Jokowi make the you know they have the priority to the respect human rights situation in Papua I think like that okay uh, thank you Kakanum uh, actually, uh, Bapa Philip, do you have anything to add, or can I go to question to, for Eben? Yeah, I think same with Mrs. Uh, Miss Anum. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Bapa. Uh, now go to uh, Eben. Uh, what more can we do in Australia to help the West Papuan political prisoners? What should we be posting more of on our social media advocacy pages? So specifically in Australia, there is a campaign to end the uh, joint training exercises uh, that the Australian government has been doing with Indonesian security forces. So uh, for many years here in the United States, uh, ETAN and other organizations we're focused on military aid and assistance that the US government was providing Indonesia. So at certain moments, similar to what Peter was calling for earlier, um, we made particular policy outcomes contingent on the release of this government aid. So now, right now in Australia, your taxes are going to support the training of Indonesian soldiers and police and um, including advanced uh, espionage techniques that are being used to target Papuan activists. Um, you can uh, start tweeting at your, your MPs, your, your senators, um, even the prime minister and, and, and the foreign minister um, asking uh, about this, uh, this aid and, and these training programs and, and joining um, a national campaign being led by Jason McLeod and Pacifica to try to bring an end um, to, to um, this, uh, this support that, you know, ethically, morally, like how, how uh, can we imagine a aid program that goes to supporting genocide, that goes to supporting um, this, this targeted policing and military violence against black lives. I, I also um, wanted to add um, something in response to an earlier question for, for Philip Karma, which is um, about the uh, promise to release political prisoners and um, the trying to explain like why we have an explosion of, of current political prisoners. So, so in, in the moment when um, uh, Philip Karma was initially offered uh, freedom, um, you know, he, he refused and, and he, he stood in solidarity with other Papuan activists, um, with activists from Ambon who were also in jail. Um, so there was an intense international campaign to free Philip Karma and President Jokowi wanted that problem to go away. And Philip Karma refused to let it go away easily. He, he said, you know, I'm not, I'm not leaving jail and, until, until, you know, it's unconditional release for myself and also my brothers who are being detained with me in solidarity. So, so I think that incredible leadership from him at an earlier moment, you know, can stand as inspiration to political prisoners behind bars in West Papua today. You know, it's not just about me getting out of jail, but it's, it's about transforming the system. It's about creating policy change on a regional and national level. And it's hard to live in, in jail. I, I visited Philip, um, on, I believe it was, was it your 53rd birthday in prison and, and Abe Pura, I brought you a cake. And, you know, it's not easy to live in these conditions of confinement, but you insisted that, you know, this was your, your burden to bear until um, there was unconditional release of, of, of all Papuan political prisoners. So I think that's why you had, you know, there was this intense campaign focused on a single individual 
and that individual had had the collective in mind, not just himself, as 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 he was in, in during this very difficult time. Thank you, Evan. Uh, that's right. Again, now uh, we are very honored to uh, have Papa Philip as a speaker today. Amazing leadership, indeed. And now uh, we go to question for uh, Peter. Um, about journalistic access to West Papua, especially after President Jokowi uh, announced free. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Let me let me repeat. I was uh, distracted uh, on the screen. Um, about journalistic access to West Papua, especially after President Jokowi announced uh, free journalism, but in fact, uh, it is still very uh, restricted. What do you think about that, uh, Peter? I think the Indonesian president made a play that journalists were now free to go to West Papua. But as you say, the reality is very, very different. Um, most journalists who apply face all kinds of restrictions and technical refusals. Um, over the years, there have been so many journalists who have been arrested or refused access. Um, some have gone in disguised as tourists and they have succeeded, but that was against the wishes and the rules of the Indonesian government. Um, right now, I don't think we can say at all that there is genuine free access for either journalists or human rights defenders in West Papua. And the very good reason is simply because Indonesia does not want the world to see what is really going on. It knows what it is doing is a blot on the conscience of humanity. It knows that if the world saw what its security forces were doing to the people of West Papua, the world would be outraged. And its simplistic repressive tactic is to make sure that doesn't happen. Peter, uh, do you think that I, uh, if uh, the uh there's international access for, uh, sorry, uh, journalist access in West Papua. Do you think that the condition of human rights will be better? Certainly, I think if, if journalists were able to go in freely, if human rights defenders were able to have access, if the United Nations were able to send a fact-finding mission there to report to the Human Rights Council, I think it would probably ameliorate, not end, but ameliorate some of Indonesia's worst excesses. But it's very clear that the political and economic benefits for Indonesia in the eyes of Jakarta outweigh bad PR and bad publicity. Um, they're prepared to take the flack of not honoring open access in order to ensure and protect those political and economic interests. And this has been going on for such a long time. I can remember way back in 1977, I went via Papua New Guinea to meet refugees from West Papua who told horror stories. And I had to do so not only with the risk of the Indonesians on my back, but also in those days, the Papua New Guinea government as well and the Australian Security Intelligence Organization. Um, you know, the efforts to which Indonesia and their yeah, allies and puppets have resorted to try and stop news coming out is extraordinary. And it does continue to this day. And frankly, until we get genuine free open access, I don't think a lot will change. If it does, that access does happen. I think some of the worst excesses may be uh, reduced, but I think Indonesia still has vested political and economic interests that it does not want to let go of. Okay. And I think the only, the only way it'll be really forced out is by a huge international campaign. I think particularly forms of economic sanctions, disinvestment, um, withdrawal of diplomatic status, those kind of things. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, and um, I agree. I can only imagine if only there were uh, 
that the, the West Papua uprising last year was afforded the same uh, access like what we are seeing in the uh, Hong Kong or uh, Black Lives Matter uprising right now, the world can see so many West Papuans uh, uh, want their self-determination. Okay, we are going to our last question. Um, uh, this is very relevant to our case right now, uh, Kaka Anum, actually Kaka Anum and yeah. Uh, from your, uh, is there, Kaka Anum, is there any chance citizens can take legal action asking the authority to review the treason article? Uh, yes, since two years ago, uh, some of the NGO try to judicial review about the treason article to the Mahkamah Constitution, but the the the, the Mahkamah Constitution rejected uh, our you know our uh, our yes uh, our uh, paper about that. Yeah, so we have the we we hope the Indonesia will you know will change or drop to the article, but in the very important is about the implementation about the article. If the Indonesia government cannot change the article, but we need the you know the the good implementation about the article. The Indonesia government cannot, you know, raise, uh, raise the people or the young people about raising the flag, you know, or yell, yell about the self-determination. This is the right of expression. The, and uh, the point in the, the Papuan, as long we have the injustice, about the law, about the social, about the economy. The people always talk about the freedom, talk about the self-determination. The people always make the flag or the, you know, uh, talk about the freedom or referendum. Every time, every time, not only in the demonstration, you can read in the book, you can look, in the conversation, you can uh, follow in the you know in the meeting every time. So this is stigma. So before the Indonesia take out the article, the very important the Indonesia government how to make the good implementation about the article. I think this is the point from me. Thank you. Thank you, Kakanum. Yeah, if I may uh, add, so uh, um, the uh, the treason article uh, team of lawyers, including me and uh, Kakanum, mm -hmm. already uh, submitted the uh, uh, legal challenge to the Constitutional Court um, two years ago, three years ago, and then um, the uh, the court uh, rejected our petition. But uh, the the finding was that um, the court finds that. Uh, the Indonesian state still needs treason articles, but the court says in the in the in the decision that the law enforcement must be careful in implementing this law so not to suppress the freedom of expression of people. So clearly, this has not been in, being uh, implemented. Like I said, a West Papua currently detained in Jayapura over Facebook posts. That's how ridiculous it is. Okay, so uh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to our uh, webinar. And also, uh, particularly, thank you, our uh, distinguished speakers, for being able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to speak, to become panelists in such short notice. And I would, again, thank uh, Tapol and Itan for, uh, for this very important webinar. Oh, and uh, I forgot that uh, uh, and what, what Eben said, uh, the, uh, uh, Jason, and, uh, in, in Australia, they say you make West Papua campaign, make West Papua safe campaign. And they're also having a, a webinar calling for the release of Balikpapan 7-2 on Monday. And they have um, fantastic lineup. So 
uh, if you're interested to learn more about this, please, uh, you can join their webinar. Thank you, everyone. Good evening and good morning for Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.